One of the main problems that we encounter when we're trying to unravel difficult passages that deal with future things or with eschatology is the genre or form of literature in which many of the biblical prophecies uh, are cast. Uh, this form of literature is sometimes called apocalyptic literature. Sometimes the nickname for the book of Revelation in the New Testament is that it's called the Apocalypse. You've heard of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse. And that which characterizes apocalyptic literature is that it tends to be exceedingly rich in vivid graphic imagery that often takes on a symbolic meaning. If you read the book of Revelation, for example, and you see the golden bowls and the vials and the, and the stars and the various uh, images that are sprinkled throughout that book, we know that it is sometimes very, very difficult to get a hold of exactly what is being communicated through these somewhat arcane uh, uh, symbols. And also, it makes apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature open to the wildest kinds of speculation, where people find all kinds of hidden meanings in these symbols. And that accounts in part for some of the vast diversity that we see in views of uh, eschatology. But when we are looking at the problems that have been raised by higher critics about the credibility of the Bible and of Jesus, I want to look first and foremost at the Olivet Discourse for this reason, well, actually for a couple of reasons. One is because here is where the guns of criticism have been chiefly aimed namely at Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives regarding His future coming. And second of all, that even though there are obviously elements to this discourse that are imaginative in the sense that uh, vivid imagery is employed, nevertheless the main thread of this discourse follows the normal didactic pattern of literature that we find throughout the Gospels. And also, we see that the content of the Olivet Discourse is contained in all three of the so-called Synoptic Gospels, so that we have Matthew's version in Matthew 24, Mark's version in Mark 13, and Luke's version in the 21st chapter of his gospel. So one of the interesting things, that if you have the time to do it, is to look at a harmony of the gospels and compare in co side columns the various uh, nuances that are provided by all three of the synoptic writers. But again, this passage that is so crucial to our consideration of eschatology is called the Olivet Discourse because it was a discussion that Jesus had with His disciples on the Mount of Olives. And in this session, I want to call your attention to Mark's rendition of the Olivet Discourse. Now, you know that Mark tends to be more terse and brief than the other synoptic writers. In fact, uh, one of the key Greek words that is found in Mark's uh, short gospel is the word euthus, which means straightway or immediately. I mean, you can read Mark at one setting and you're almost are out of breath by the time you're finished because it moves at such a rapid pace. Well, we look at the 13th chapter of Mark's gospel and we read these words. Then as he, that is Jesus, went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
Now let me comment on this. Obviously, the progression here is that the disciples have left the temple complex, and if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that the uh, Mount of Olives is, is uh, a stone's throw away from the city of Jerusalem that overlooks the city of Jerusalem. There's a valley in between. And the wall that is uh, facing the Mount of Olives is the temple wall. And so, obviously, as they are leaving the temple area, Jesus makes this comment as he and his disciples are headed toward the Mount of Olives. <coughs> he said, you see these stones here, not one stone will be left upon another. Now, one of the great ironies of this whole discussion about the credibility of the New Testament and the credibility of Jesus is that fulfillment of future prophecies have been one, or has been, one of the main arguments used by scholars to defend the authority of the Bible and its supernatural origin. Because how else could events that take place many, many years or centuries after the uh, prophecy has been given, can we explain uh, fulfilled prophecies, like the thousands of prophecies that have been fulfilled in the life of Jesus, down to the village in which he was born, that sort of thing. Well, in New Testament, in terms of New Testament prophecy, perhaps there are no two prophecies in the New Testament that are fulfilled with more astonishing historical accuracy which two prophecies, in terms of their fulfillment, should be enough to silence the mouths of critics forever. Jesus clearly predicted ahead of time the destruction of the Jewish temple and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and add to that the dispersion of the Jews to all parts of the world as it was added in Luke 21. Now, we know that these prophecies were made before the time occurred where the temple actually was destroyed and the city was leveled by the Romans in the year 70 A.D. That date, 70 A.D., for the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Herodian temple is one of the best attested dates for anything that ever happened in the ancient world. We simply flat out know what year that took place. Now, prior to that, some 40 years, or close to 40 years before the event, Jesus of Nazareth is reported by the gospel writers, some of which are undoubtedly written prior to this event. He predicts a future event that was absolutely unthinkable to the Jew of that day to say that that temple with its Herodian stones, which is one of the wonders of the ancient world, would be completely raised. And that for the Jew to think that the sacred city of Jerusalem would be annihilated and trodden underfoot by Gentiles was not something that people guessed at by way of, of projecting prognostications. These were radical predictions about the future, and that they came to pass with such astonishing accuracy, as I said, is, should be grist for the ap ap apologetic mill. Unfortunately, it's because in the same context in which Jesus makes these predictions about this, the temple and Jerusalem, that he talks about his coming in clouds of glory. And that becomes part of the mix of the prophecy. And that part is the part that is problematic with respect to its fulfillment. Here, that text, which should be one of the greatest proofs of the credibility of Jesus and of the Bible, has become the very text that the critics hone in on to refute the Scriptures and the claims of Christ. But we see at the beginning the prediction about the destruction of the temple. Verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, 
asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Now you get the question. Jesus sits down with his disciples. He's just made this incredible prediction, and they're asking him two questions. Tell us when. Not where, not how, not what, not who. When. That is a question with respect to time. The disciples want to know when this is all going to happen. It's as simple as can be. It's plain uh, in, in, interrogative here. And the second question is, what will be the sign? What will point us to the moment? What will lead us or guide us to an awareness of the imminence of these things. When will all of these things take place? What will be the sign? Now those are the questions. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, these things that Jesus just spells out have to do with the answer to the question of what will the sign of the fulfillment of all these things be. And in popular nomenclature, these events that he talks about that have to take place, wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, nations, famines, earthquakes, and all of that sort of thing, are popularly called in Christian nomenclature what? The signs of the times. Just recently. I read an article where somebody was giving a study of the increased frequency of measurable earthquakes in the 20th century over earlier centuries, the number of famines that have been reported around the world, the amount of violence that's been recorded in the 20th century with the wars and rumors of wars that we've had all in the service of coming to the conclusion that Christ is coming any day now because we're seeing the signs of the times rapidly being fulfilled. So again, the majority of futuristically oriented interpreters of the uh, Olivet Discourse see all of these things that Jesus is saying here as signs that will not take place until literally thousands of years after the time that the prophecy was first made. These are the beginnings of sorrows, but watch out for yourselves. Now, no, now notice in verse 9, Jesus says to his disciples, watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, you will be beaten in the synagogues, you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or meditate what you will speak, but whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, one of the problems we have when we read these prophecies is that we make the assumption 
that the primary people to whom these prophecies are addressed are us. We read these prophecies as if they were written last week, and that Jesus wasn't talking to his contemporaries, wasn't talking to his disciples, but he was talking to us, or at least by extension to us. Now, that's a sound principle insofar as we believe that the application throughout the New Testament of Jesus' words to his disciples comes down through the centuries to every generation of Christians. But again, let us not forget that here Jesus is answering a question to specific people at a specific time in history when they said to him, when will these things take place? And he says, certain things have to take place first. And then he says to them, but you will be brought before kings and rulers and suffer persecutions. Now let me just pause for a second and ask the question. Did that part of the prediction take place, according to the book of Acts, to the contemporaries of Jesus who heard that warning? Yes. I mean, they were indeed persecuted at that time. So watch for yourselves, for they will deliver to you to councils. You will be beaten. You will be brought. You, 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 when they arrest you, and so on. Then verse 14, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it not, ought not, let the reader understand, and this is a very mysterious part of the text, <coughs> then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, pregnant, and to those who were nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter, for in those days there will be tribulation such has not been seen since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time nor ever shall be. And unless the, the Lord had shortened these days, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he, cho he chose, he shortened the days. Now, Here we hear about the abomination of desolation, and we hear about the Great Tribulation. Popularized in the best-selling book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And all of the arguments and discussions that go on among Christians today about whether Jesus is going to come before the Tribulation, during the Tribulation, or after the Tribulation. But along with this forecast of a tribulation, and it's all part of answering the question, when will these things be? Jesus gives specific directions on how to avoid the tribulation. When you see these things take place, flee. If you're in Judea, head for the hills. Now, what we're going to be looking at in the course of this study is the fierce suffering and tribulation that came upon the Jewish nation in terms of the conquest of Palestine by the Roman armies and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was the first great holocaust of history, where 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered in the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. And one of the things that we know from history that's remarkable is that when Palestine was invaded, and the Romans were taking town by town, village by village, before they even began the siege of Jerusalem. And the armies crossed the borders. One of the reasons why there were so many people killed in Jerusalem was that people went to Jerusalem seeking safety behind the massive walls of the great city. Because that was the normal process in antiquity that when a, an advancing army came, people fled for the walled cities for safety. Jesus says to his disciples, when you see these things happen, don't go to the city, but go to the hills, which is exactly what the early Christian community did in 70 AD. Where the Jews fled to the city, the followers of Jesus took heed of these warnings and fled 
elsewhere. Now, let's continue. And if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. <coughs> I have told you all these things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then will he gather his angel and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. Now we see the crux of the problem. We're now Jesus answering these questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of his coming? Now he talks about signs in the heavens, not just signs on the earth astronomical perturbations. The sun doesn't give its light, the moon, you know, and so on. And we talk about all of these things as harbingers of the final sign of the coming of Jesus in clouds of glory. Here, Jesus clearly includes his coming in glory as part of the content of this prophecy. And it's that part that later on in the text is included when he says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all of these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So, included in this future prophecy is not just the destruction of the temple, and not just the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, but also Jesus' clear prediction of his coming at the end of the age on clouds of glory. And all of these things, he says, are going to take place before that generation passes away. Now, what do we do with this? Well, there are several options. The first option is the option that the critics give, namely that Jesus was simply mistaken that he meant by this generation, that living group of people who would last for no more than 40 years. And it didn't happen. He was wrong. The second view of this is to spiritualize the term generation, to mean something other than a time frame reference of 40 years, and it can be indefinite, looking for a literal fulfillment of all of the content. Third option is to take a second glance at what Jesus was specifically talking about in the Olivet Discourse in terms of his coming. Was he speaking about his final coming at the end of time? Or was he speaking of his coming at the end of the Jewish age? Which is not the end of history, because the Bible makes a distinction between the age of the Jews and the age of the Gentiles. Now, more modern scholarship has paid much more attention to this concept of the end of the age than has been done in the past. And, and we're going to explore the possibility that what Jesus is talking about here in the Olivet Discourse is not his final appearance at the end of history, but his coming in judgment upon the Jewish nation in 70 A.D. But we'll take that up in our next session.